Hello, my name is Margaret Murphy, and I'm a pharmacist at Boston Children's Hospital. Today I'm presenting a case about treating essential fatty acid deficiency in a pediatric patient with hypertriglyceridemia. After the presentation, you should be able to recognize risk factors that can lead to development of essential fatty acid deficiency, or EFAD, understand differences among different intravenous lipid emulsions with regards to EFAD treatment, and identify strategies to treat EFAD in patients with hypertriglyceridemia. Let's start with a quick review of EFAD. Linoleic acid and omega-6 fatty acid and alpha-linolenic acid and omega-3 aren't made by the human body and must be consumed through the diet, so they are referred to as essential fatty acids. LA and ALA are converted by enzymes to longer chain fatty acids, which are involved in many important physiological processes. If the body is deficient in LA and ALA, enzymes preferentially act on oleic acid, an omega-9 fatty acid, resulting in increased production of meat acid. If that is very rare in healthy individuals who consume a varied diet, risk factors for developing EFAD include conditions that limit the intake, absorption, or metabolism of fat. That can include chronic GI disorders and PN-dependent patients whose IV lipids are restricted. Patients with limited fat stores are especially at risk, including patients with malnutrition. Patients with EFAD may have both biochemical and physical signs. An elevated triene to tetraene, or T to T ratio, represents the body's increased production of meat acid in relation to arachidonic acid and is indicative of EFAD. Clinical signs of EFAD include a dry scaly rash, hair loss, poor wound healing, impaired growth, and increased susceptibility to infection. To prevent EFAD, at least 2-4% to of total energy as LA and 0.25-0.5% to as ALA should be provided. Per current guidelines, recommended dosing in children is 0.1 gram per kilogram per day of LA, which would also provide enough ALA using currently available IV lipid formulations. This chart gives an overview of different commercially available intravenous lipid emulsions, which include 100% soybean oil products, 100% fish oil products, and some composite products with varying content of soybean, coconut, olive, and fish oils. Soybean oil is the major contributor of LA and ALA, so the amount of lipid emulsion needed to provide sufficient energy from LA and ALA depends on its soybean oil content. A 100% soybean oil emulsion will require a lower overall lipid dose than a composite or fish oil-based lipid emulsion to prevent or treat EFAD. Now to our case, which concerns an 11-year-old male who's 55 days status post a stem cell transplant. He presented to an outpatient clinic visit with abdominal pain and profuse diarrhea. Current medications include cyclosporin and prednisolone. His labs revealed a high cyclosporin level and were consistent with dehydration and acute kidney injury, so he was admitted to the hospital. His past medical history is significant for Wilms tumor two years prior. He unfortunately developed treatment-related myelodysplastic syndrome, which necessitated a stem cell transplant. His post-transplant course has been complicated by gastrointestinal graft-versus-host disease. Prior to transplant, the patient was adequately nourished, weighing 59.6 kilograms. The day prior to his transplant, he started nasogastric feeds in anticipation that he wouldn't be able to consume sufficient oral calories. Unfortunately, after the transplant, he was never able to tolerate his GOL-NG feeds due to abdominal discomfort, and he was discharged just over a month later on two-thirds GOL-NG feeds and IV hydration fluid. At that time, his weight was down 5.3 kilograms. At home, the patient was non-compliant with his NG feeds, often shutting them off due to feeling full. It was estimated he was getting only about 25% of total goal feeds daily. Upon this admission, the Clinical Nutrition Service was consulted for initiation of TPN. On examination, the nutrition team noted that the patient appeared adequately nourished but cushingoid and edematous, which could be masking signs of malnutrition. His weight was 49.3 kilos, which represented a weight loss of 10.3 kilos in two months and 3.1 kilos in the last week. He had markedly increased stool output in excess of 1.2 liters per day, as well as decreased urine output. His overall picture was suggestive of acute kidney injury, likely secondary to dehydration, and a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, 
likely due to excessive intestinal anion losses. The nutrition team's diagnosis was unspecified severe protein calorie malnutrition, as well as altered GI function related to GI GVHD. So the nutrition plan was to initiate PN with soybean oil lipid emulsion, slowly advancing to around 2,000 calories over the next few days. On PN day 6, the lipid was switched from a soybean oil emulsion to a composite lipid emulsion. This was done due to anticipated long-term PN course per our institution's standard practice. On PN day 7, the lipid dose was increased to 1.2 grams per kilo per day and cycled over 12 hours. Unfortunately, the patient developed severe hypertriglyceridemia, as you can see here. Prior to PN initiation, he'd had elevated triglycerides in the 400s, attributed to a combination of medications. Triglycerides were 389 milligrams per deciliter when checked on PND2, in line with his recent levels. A few medication adjustments were made around this time. On PND6, the patient was started on ruxolitinib for his GVHD, and on PND9, cyclosporin therapy was converted to sirolimus. Both ruxolitinib and sirolimus are known to cause hypertriglyceridemia. Triglycerides were rechecked on PND13 and found to be 2540. Lipids were immediately stopped and a level was rechecked a few hours later, which was still very elevated at 1629. Lipids remained held, but triglycerides stayed in the high 1000s over the next weeks, then began to trend down while still remaining very elevated. Because the patient was now not receiving any lipid source and had a malnutrition diagnosis, a fatty acid panel was drawn on PND22 due to concern for EFAD. The results showed an elevated T to T ratio and elevated meat acid. Based on these labs, the patient was diagnosed with severe EFAD. The nutrition team restarted a soybean oil lipid emulsion at a dose of 0.5 grams per kilogram three times a week. This would give the patient an average daily dose of 0.1 gram per kilogram per day LA, the minimum recommended dose in children. Considerations for this patient are that he's going to be on PN long term and so will require IV lipids for the foreseeable future. The other major factor is his hypertriglyceridemia. We want to ensure we're providing enough LA and ALA while minimizing his total lipid dose. That's why soybean oil lipid emulsion is the best choice here. Soybean oil has a higher LA and ALA content compared to the same dose of a composite or fish oil lipid emulsion. Additionally, three times weekly dosing rather than daily dosing will give time for triglyceride clearance between the doses. While soybean oil is the best choice, there are some case reports in pediatrics who received fish oil lipid emulsion, which suggest it may be able to prevent or treat EFAD, thought due to its relatively high DHA and EPA content. The omega-3 fatty acids in fish oil may also help to lower triglycerides. Here you can see the patient's triglycerides continued to come back down towards his baseline, even after the soybean oil lipid emulsion was restarted. Sirolimus was also discontinued during this time, which helped correct the hypertriglyceridemia. His T to T ratio improved as well, and the patient was discharged on PN day 61, with continuing close follow-up by the home PN team. His weight was back up to 51.4 kilograms. So takeaways from this case should include that restriction of IV lipids may be necessary for some PN patients due to hypertriglyceridemia. IV lipid restriction in these patients may lead to EFAD, especially in patients with other risk factors. And EFAD treatment is essential and requires careful consideration of the proper lipid formulation and dosing, and will require close follow-up and monitoring. I'd like to thank Aspen and Presenius Kabi for the opportunity to present this case as part of Malnutrition Awareness Week. Thank you.